Hi everyone, my name is Yang. I'm from Nipian ICO Genomic Research Unit. The topic I'm going to cover today is epigenetics. Firstly, just a bit of uh, history and definition on epigenetics. So the term epigenetics was first coined by British embryologist Conrad Evelyn in 1942. During that time, the physical nature of genes and their role was largely unknown and hence uh, epigenetic was used mainly as a conceptual model to describe how genetic components might interfere, inter interact with the surroundings to produce a phenotype. And later on in 1990 and in 1996, uh, Robin Hollidays and uh, Arthur Riggs redefined epigenetics most, more specifically as something that can influence the development of our de um, influence the development of organism and also the function of genes. And in 2008, a consensus definition of uh, epigenetics was given in the Cold Spring Harbor meetings as a stably heritable um, phenotype resulting from changes in the chromosome without alteration in the DNA sequence. So a good example of how epigenetics might influencing the phenotype without altering the DNA sequence is the identical twins. So our phenotypes is <laughs> Um, they share the same uh, identical genome, but with different epigenome. Hence, uh, we see the difference in their characteristics, in their skills, as well as the risk of diseases. So the phenotypes of, um, of uh, human um, is depend not only on the genomes um, that we inherited from the parents, but also on the epigenetics, which works by adding or removing uh, chemical marks um, in order to determine how much or little of the gene is expressed. And the whole collection of these uh, chemical marks is known as epigenome. So epigenetics regulate the phenotypes at many levels through various mechanisms or factors. Both DNA transcription and the RNA translation can be modulated by these factors, which include DNA methylation, histone modification, and non-coding RNA. And today I'm going to explain briefly on how each of these might influence the gene expression and the protein expression. Firstly, let's look at DNA methylation and how you regulate the DNA gene expression. So DNA methylation is a highly specific chemical process which in mammals is always um, found in um, sequence where there's a cytosine um, uh, next to a guanine nucleotide connected by a phosphate, known as the CPG site. A methyl group will then add it to the cytosine nucleotide and influence the gene expression. Um, usually, um, there's a few uh, cluster of CPG sites and form a CPG island. So how does DNA methylation um, influence the gene expression? Usually, usually, the CPG sites are located in the promoter region of a gene. So methylation would typically lead to the repression of the gene transcription. In other words, the gene is usually turned on when the CPG sites is uh, unmethylated. And when the methylation happens, the gene was turned off. So histone modifications comes in many other types in addition to uh, methylation. Histone can also be modulated by acetylation, phosphorylation, and ubiquitination. This modification can either repress or activate the gene expression depending on what part of the histones are modified and the degree and the types of the modification. So histone is a protein complex, consists of eight proteins, two copies of each of the four core proteins known as H2A, 2B, H3, and H4. Is acting uh, uh, like a structure. Um, it is acting like a spool um, around which the DNA winds to create um, nu um, structure units known as the nucleosome. And nucleosome is the basic, the primary building block for chromatin, which condenses further to form a chromosome. So um, when modification, um, when histone was modified by those. Um, acetylation, methylation, as mentioned in the previous slides, that will change the structure of the chromosome and hence uh, affect the gene expression. So in general, um, 
the histone modification that encourage a tighter binding between DNA and histone leads to a, a, a conformation with a closed or more compact conformation that leads to the suppression of the gene expression. And on the other hand, any uh, modification that could um, um, leads to a open, more open chromatin uh, conformation will lead to enhanced gene expression. So in general, um, um, histone acetylation and phosphorylation will neutralize the positive charge on the histone protein and hence create an open structure for the, of the chromatin. And then um, that leads to enhanced gene expression. On the other hand, methylation and uh, ubiquitination can either lead to a closed or, or open chromatin structure, depending on um, where they are located and the, how much of the local, um, the degree of the modification. Uh, next, we're talking about non-coding RNA. Our human genome contains three billion base pairs, and only one to two percent of the DNA is coding, meaning they can be turned into a protein. And this one to two percent DNA is then transcribed into coding RNA. Um, and which is usually known to us as messenger or mRNA. And the large majority of the, our um, genome is actually non-coding uh, RNA. There are many types of non-coding RNA, and uh, they could be either a regulatory type or they can be housekeeping, depending on their functions. So regulatory non-coding RNA can regulate gene expression through various mechanisms. And housekeeping non-coding RNA mainly involved in the transcription, in the translation of RNA into protein. Regulatory um, non-coding RNA can be further divided into short or long non-coding RNA um, based on their size, with the short one usually less than 200 base pair, and the long one is greater than 200 base pair. And the housekeeping um, non-coding RNA, including the transfer and the ribosomal RNA, which two of them are involved in the translation of RNA into proteins. So short non-coding RNA can be further divided into small interfering RNA, or siRNA, and microRNA. Um, and also, um, the long non-coding RNA can be intergenic, intronic, sense, or antisense, uh, referring to their position in relation to the gene and um, the exons and, um, in, in the gene, in position in the genome. And today, I'll be mainly talking about the regulatory non-coding RNA and how they regulate gene expression. <coughs> Let's first look at how microRNA and small interferon RNA, or uh, SIRNA, regulate gene uh, expression. Both of them are known as a short non-coding RNA, as mentioned earlier, which undergoes a similar mechanism of gene silencing by a process known as RNA interference. There are, however, some differences between these two. Um, micro, um, microRNA is uh, mainly formed within as an endogenous non-coding RNA in the nucleus. Uh, it's first formed as a pre-microRNA, um, then gets transported into the cytoplasm. On the other hand, the uh, siRNA usually comes from an uh, external source, mainly uh, such as the virus as a double-stranded RNA. And both of them went through, go through the similar process of dicing, um, forming one strand and also the binding to a protein. So basically, the dicer would um, make um, a short duplex of microRNA and the siRNA, which usually base is around 20 to 25 base pair. And one of the strands of this duplex is then gets removed by the enzyme known as helicus. And the remaining strand then uh, binds to a protein known as argonauts to form um, this RNA-induced silencing complex, also known as RISC. So RISC can, can then bind and find a target mRNA, bind to them, and then results in the translation block, or actually um, leads to the cleavage of the my, micro RNA, uh, the mRNA. There's um, another difference between the microRNA and siRNA um, in that the microRNA can actually bind to multiple targets due to the imperfect base pairing, whereas the siRNA can only bind to a specific target. 
Um, say similar to the short non-coding RNA, long non-coding RNA also regulate gene expression, but through very um, different mechanism. They regulate gene expression at multiple levels by interacting with proteins, RNA, and DNA to regulate either the structure of protein or um, by regulate the mRNA stability. And uh, furthermore, they can uh, repress the transcription directly. So firstly, the long non-coding RNA can um, bind to the protein uh, such as epigenetic um, uh, regulators, and then uh, which acting like a, a scaffold to um, interfere the structural chromatin. If long non-coding RNA bind to uh, epigenetic activator, they will open up the structure of the chromatin, forming an open conformation. And um, then this leads to enhanced gene expression um, as a result of um, the, the opening that allowed the access of transcription factor and RNA polymerase. And on the other hand, if um, long non-coding RNA binds to epigenetic repressor, which kind of cause um, the chromosome to be condensed further, form a closed conformation, this will limit the access of RNA polymerase and hence repress the gene expression. Um, long non-coding RNA can also bind to a target mRNA directly and then result in the degradation cleav cleavage of the target mRNA. And also, um, it can also um, bind to microRNA um, by acting as a competing endogenous RNA and hence remove the microRNA binding to the target uh, mRNA. Lastly, um, long non-coding RNA can bind directly to the double-stranded DNA form the triple helix and then repress uh, transcription of DNA into RNA. So you may wonder why we study epigenetics and how it's relevant to us. So the answer to this is that epigenetics is crucial for both development and disease pathogenesis. The effects of epigenetics in on our development happens even before we are born. And this graph here actually shows, demonstrate the changes in DNA uh, methylation during the embryonic development. So during the early development, DNA methylation marks was largely removed, erased. And then after that, uh, the novel synthesis of DNA methylation takes off soon after. And at later stage, the tissue-specific uh, epigenetic marks uh, will be set up um, as well. Furthermore, our epigenetics also changes with our age. As we grow older, there's a general, uh, there's a global reduction in DNA methylation, as you can see in this. And at the same time, an increase in um, uh, DNA um, in the promoter hypermethylation with uh, regard to the TSG, which is the tumor suppressor genes. And this is associated with an uh, increased risk of cancer. So how, um, let's look at specifically how this DNA hypermethylation can lead to development of cancer. So in the human genomes, CPG islands are mainly located in the gene promoter regions, um, which is here in, on, the, on the five prime of the target genes. And uh, they are the targets for DNA hypermethylation in cancers. It's estimated that 5 to 10 percent of the promoters are hypermethylated in the cancers. And this um, leads to the suppression of the genes, uh, particularly the tumor suppressor genes, and that favors the development of the cancer of cancer. Here I list out a few well-studied um, um, tumor suppressor genes that have been shown to be hypermethylated in the different tumors. So as you can see, the RB gene in the retinoblastoma, the BRCA gene as in the breast cancer, and the sep 9 genes in um, the colorectal cancer. In not, another important epigenetic factor that's known to be associated with cancer development is histone deacetylation. So as mentioned earlier, histone acetylation can remove the positive charge of on the histones, hence pro um, promoting the formation of uh, open um, chromatin with enhanced gene expression. However, in the cancer, it was shown that there's 
a highly um, reduction in um, the acetylation process and the increase in the deacetylation process. Hence, this leads to the suppression of tumor um, suppressed expression or tumor suppressor genes, and that is associated with increased risk of cancer. So based on these findings, drugs have been developed and approved for treatment of cancer. Um, as you can see in this table here, uh, these are all the drugs approved for use in the cancer, different type of cancer. Some of them are targeting the DNA hypermethylation, and some of them are actually targeting the T-stone deacetylation. So to summarize how epigenetics work, I would like to think genes as uh, a unit in this apartment block. The light on or off represent either the gene is turned on or turned off, and the brightness and dimness of the lights represent either enhanced or suppressed gene expression. So the role of epigenetics is like this uh, dimmer switch, which decides which lights get turned on and which lights get turned off, and which one is brighter and uh, dimmer. Um, and with this, um, I thank you for listening to today's talk and hopefully it will enlighten the eyes of your understanding of epigenetics. Thank you. <laughs>